All right, everyone. Uh, next up, we have Ricky Terrell, uh, and he's going to be telling us about uh, a topic that I find extremely interesting, uh, functional reactive programming. Uh, and he's got uh, something with a, what looks like a really cool user interface device uh, that he's hooking up to that, uh, and he's using F Sharp for it. Yeah, that's so. great. Right. Thank All you. Right. Thank you for the introduction. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. So I know it's Friday, 4 o'clock, so hopefully you get your extra caffeine to go. So my name is Ricardo, and um, oh, Ricky is uh, probably I prefer to go. Uh, I'm here to talk about FRP today as uh, for um, functional reactive uh, programming for natural user interface. So for time constraint, I'm really going to focus uh, for the meat, uh, for, for the um, um, functionality programming, right? The natural user interfaces, I will cover uh, uh, probably uh, during the code sample in the hand, they're going to use uh, this cool device, right, that you mentioned. It's a um, gesture sensor used to develop uh, natural interfaces. So in the hand, um, I'm going to play little video games, right, use uh, and develop using FRP and F Sharp. Now, uh, all the research and paper that I use and being uh, written in ASCO, so probably get some more interest for the audience here probably today. So, um, Actually, this, this uh, uh, talk really is the result uh, from my own experience in a proof of concept and, uh, that I did in a previous job. Now I left the company, but anyway, so uh, that I really, I have to build this uh, um, project, this library in, uh, in F Sharp, because apparently there is no such um, um, framework built in F Sharp for FRP. So really this is like my journey to understand the first original paper uh, I've written from Connor Elliott later on till the push and pull, and, and uh, we will see how that goes, right? So this is the agenda for today. I will cover uh, what is uh, FRP, and a little um, diversion I'm going to cover the, you know, the confusion between reactive programming and FRP, right? So it'll be a whole history about FRP. Then we're going to cover, uh, cover the foundation, the motivation about functionality programming. And uh, I'm going to cover about the implementation that I did in F Sharp, uh, in both re um, following the first, the original paper, and then the more, the more modern one. And then we're going to cover, of course, the, 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 the code sample. Now, I plan to probably spend 25 minutes in slides and the rest in code sample. Pro I'm pro probably more pragmatic, right? Uh, briefly about me. I'm originally from Italy, that's where my accent comes from, and I love pugs. Nothing wrong with that, right? <laughs> uh, I'm the organizer of the DCF Sharp user group, so if you are in the area, please join us. And I just recently uh, switched job for a, a Start Muse, which is a dynamic uh, um, startup based in San Francisco. We do uh, natural language processing in F Sharp, which is very nice. And I, halfway through, authoring a book about uh, writing concurrence application applying uh, the um, functional paradigm in C sharp and F sharp. All right, so let's get started. So, what is FRP, right? So, this is not really an easy answer, especially these days, right? We have uh, um, one side of the industry, the academic industry, industry that uh, uh, knows that FRP is about you know um, values that change over time. Then we have the other side of the industry that is about, you know, FRP more like an umbrella, uh, a set of different terms that, uh, with different definition. And to me, uh, the fact is that we have three words here, right? But if you combine these three words, well, you have different kind of combination, different kind of meaning, right? So first we have functional programming. And with the audience here today, I don't think really I have to give you, you know, the definition of functional programming, but, you know, is a... It's a paradigm that you know, treat computation, evaluation, expression, and you know, uh, avoid the, the mutational state and follow specific properties, right? But then, let's go forward, and we can combine even more and say, okay, from these same three words, we have reactive programming, right? And that was a confusion come, right? So reactive means um, responsive to stimulus, right? And uh, reactive programming is becoming ubiquitous these days. If you are building any kind of application when you have to um, build some sort of real-time component, right, that uh, 
yet to response to a uh, reactive, tec um, reactive uh, event using reactive techniques, right? And this is uh, where the confusion um, uh, raised, right? Because people think that if you apply any kind of high order operation on event, right? Like some sort of, um, can you see the, the slides here? Uh, you know, if you can apply high order operation on events such as filter, map, flat map, you're doing uh, functionality programming. And this is not true, right? This is F sharp. This is an event combinator, like when you apply high order function and, and you can chain high order function to, to an event, right? And so the issue I think is because there is a, a very close relation between functional programming and reactive programming because reactive programming really use a functional uh, programming um, uh, construct, you know, f to, to create these uh, composable event abstraction, right? And then finally we have functional reactive programming, which is the topic today. And um, this is about uh, a paper that was written uh, 20 years ago from uh, these guys here, Connor Elliott and uh, Paul Hudaki. And uh, it's really about um, dynamic revolving values over time which means you can get values that vary over time avoiding the mutational state. And we're gonna go over, you know, during the presentation in more details about. So this is the original paper that was written in 97. And um, this is the original paper about FRP, which described how it was implemented using Haskell and uh, to write and, and using a library, um, Fran, as a function rate animation to interact with uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional graphics. A fran is, is based upon the notion of um, two polymorphic data type, uh, which are behaviors and event. And we cover about these data types later because they're very important about FRP. And um, which are, uh, this data type really cover um, uh, the value that change of continuous time and discrete time, right? And these two concepts concept are still used today uh, for building modern uh, FRP. So FRP uh, is a paradigm used for building graphical user interfaces and uh, um, animation. Really, the goal, the intention was really to avoid complexity and, and to reduce complexity compared to uh, a traditional style. So this is some domain where FRP and, uh, has been used, or anyways, has been used as an inspiration, right? And re recently it's been uh, heavily used in uh, uh, virtual reality and games. But moreover, we see uh, how uh, FRP has been introduced in mainstream, right? And how, um, probably obviously, they have a very um, close um, influence in the web application, like front-end application, right? Like BaconJS, um, RxJS, and so on. To me, uh, the, the more interesting is Elm, because Elm, if you're any Elm developer here? Oh, cool. So Elm is interesting because it's not just a library or a framework, but it's really a rewrite uh, a new language uh, for make um, FRP more digestible for developer, right? So we see anyways how FRP really uh, take and, and evolve in a different kind of direction over time. All right, so, so what is FRP, right? So FRP is this paradigm really uh, for building a reactive system uh, that provide um, composable abstraction uh, uh, over um, dynamics values. and. Uh, uh, we're gonna talk later about uh, how these values, they have a very precise uh, denotational semantic, right? And denotational semantic is a mathematical model, right? And we cover, I think, in the next slide or two. Um, and it's used really to build um, elegant and, and very pretty vocabulary, right, around your, your API. So there are two main um, 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 concepts that shape FRP. One is denotative, right, uh, which means that it is a, use again a very precise compositional semantic to specify um, the meaning of each type in building blocks. And then uh, temporally continuous, which is uh, cover more the, the compositional aspect of functional reactive programming, right? And now is used uh, uh, to compose correctly uh, uh, these building blocks. 
Okay, so denotational semantic. Um, it's a fairly simple concept, but um, Connor Elliott in his paper really uh, have a very strong opinion about uh, this concept, and uh, I found it very interesting. But it, it, it's a fairly simple concept. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a mathematical expression, and then uh, he used use really to um, express the formal meaning of a program of a program, um, programming language, right? So the idea really provides a, a, a mathematical interpretation for each construct of your language or your program, right? And, and with that, think about if you want to prove the correctness or your property, you just prove the mathematical theorem, right? So in this slide, we have the, the, uh, the, the factorial uh, number calculation, right? So this is a, a ASCO, which is a very strong denotation of semantic. We have the expression from uh, 1 to n, which is pretty clear. Uh, we have the uh, product function, right, that what it does is just calculate the, 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 the product for each uh, number of the, 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 of the list. So this is really uh, a strong denotation semantic, pretty much just a factorial taken from a, a math text, right? So this is the same one in C. So I think it's pretty clear which one has a denotation semantic and which one no, right? So, so Again, the motivation and the benefit of the notation of semantic uh, according to the, the paper of Conor Elliott is really that lead to simple design. And uh, it, to me, really, uh, I understood after a while uh, what they mean with that. Really, it, to simple design, it really leads to um, an easier reason about, right? And with that, uh, it gives you the opportunity to reason even further down because if a simple design, uh, you can even uh, elaborate and, and, uh, and, and, com and create a more complete and, and, uh, uh, library, right? So really, the goal is uh, an elegant semantic and more reusable abstraction. All right, so if you have any question, please feel free to interrupt me. All right, so let's start to define, you know, uh, the FRP implementation or the, the data types used to model this paradigm. First of all, we have the notion of time, right? Continuous time. And uh, of course, it is uh, denoted by the uh, domain time, uh, which is uh, synonymous of real numbers in F sharp used float. And uh, the choice of continuous time is uh, um, used to make progress more composable uh, compared to program, programs that use discrete time. But let's make a, a step back one second. Uh, I talk about continuous time, right? But there is also this concept about virtual time used to other um, FRP that are more like uh, reactive programming. So the difference is that continuous time is this concept that really, um, think about the clock, right? If you check now your clock, you get a value. If you check a little bit later, you get another value because really the time flow under the scene, right? Instead, virtual time, well, you can switch the concurrency model at any time, right? Uh, you, can, you can switch the computation where, uh, without respect to the time, right? You can rerun uh, the high order operation against uh, an historical data, uh, having maybe this time stem of 10 years ago you can run it today, right? All right, behavior. Behavior is probably the more important um, data types in, in uh, FRP. It's a polymorphic data type that uh, um, evolves over time, uh, which means that for every time there is a specific value, right? So semantically, as you can see, is a just a function to go from time to a value, right? And uh, which means that every time you can sample a behavior and yield the value, right? Think about the mouse. Uh, conceptually, uh, the mouse, when you click the mouse, it is script, but the motion is continuous, right? The behavior is continuous. And uh, what is interesting is that like in modern implementation, like, like uh, Elm, like they discharge almost the implementation of behaviors because uh, it's easier, I think, it's easier to, to grasp, understand the concept of the event 
versus uh, behavior more abstract, right? So uh, you can see that all this modern implementation go toward more an event. And to me, I think that behavior go toward more like a user cases that are uh, more use, useful in animation kind of thing. There probably there are less user cases, I guess. But so and uh, so with a simple data type we've just defined, um, we can already define a few behaviors, right? We have the behavior time, which is time itself, which the uh, uh, identity function. We have uh, the behavior that return always the same value, which is a constant behavior. And uh, we can create a behavior that just increase the time of 2.5, like increase the speed, right? Which is nice because now uh, we can uh, define uh, the, the speed uh, of an object, like in the increase or decrease, through a function. So this is the API uh, from the first paper, right? So we have the, the lift function, they just take a, a, a value and lift uh, the, the, the value in a behavior box, in a behavior world, right? We can lift one value, two value, and so on. And with that, you can see we can rewrite uh, the behavior already in, in a different way. We can use the lift to recreate uh, the, 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 the time, time seven, right? To increase the speed and so forth. So now we have um, events, right? So behavior, as we discussed, we, um, uh, are continuous. But sometimes we should have something that uh, reacts to discrete event, right? And, and behavior uh, can change value or can create also accordingly uh, through something, right? And that's uh, where a, a event come, come, in, come in play. So event is this polymorphic data type uh, which can have a value or not, and they are discrete. They really are represented to a sequence of um, order by time event, right? And uh, is, a, is a value, um, is a pair uh, time value, which is the value is the option, right? And the time is uh, monotonically not decreasing because, of course, the time is continuous. So with that, think about we can create an event like that can happen after three seconds, for instance, and, uh, and can return uh, uh, the speed of 2.5 increase. All right, so let's take a look about a, a quick example in the slide here. Um, like the behavior of, a, to check a two-state behavior if the mouse maybe is uh, inside the rectangle, right? All right, so the, the, the event-based view with the classic um, approach, right, that uh, we have the event they return the position of the mouse, which is not the true FRP approach, right? Because the position of the mouse is, uh, is, uh, is not discrete. It should be you no know, continuous over time. So the more, the, the, actually the FRP view is uh, the behavior approach, where the behavior is the position of the mouse that can be sample. sample. So I can create my the in rectangle behavior, where I pass this argument uh, to uh, um, the, the two extreme of the rectangle, which is the upper uh, left corner, lower right corner. And then inside of the behavior, I can sample the, the, the current position of the, the, of the mouse and return if it is inside or not of the rectangle, All right? So in this example, I can see I can uh, um, do two fundamental operations, right? One, I can sample the, the, the behavior at any current time, right? And the other one, I can create behavior from other behavior. But most important, really, is that behavior associates a value uh, to each point in time, right? And uh, what is interesting is that uh, behavior is a function, right? So it's not anymore, uh, um, in the slide here, the, the value represented not anymore from the, the ordinary value, but from a function that goes from time to values, right? And of course, the dot are just the event which are discrete. All right, this is all cool. This was the, you know, pretty much the first paper implementation and we're gonna see in action in the, in the, in the first paper. But how are you gonna implement it, right? From where you start? So um, apparently um, uh, in answer to uh, Conor Elliott in Stack Overflow, uh, FRP is simple that you should invent yourself. And uh, I'm very passionate about FRP, right? And uh, um, I think it's just a very fascinating topic. 
is uh, semantics beautiful, right? Uh, we have a behavior function over time, and um, you know you have the event; they all place very nicely together. We have equation reasoning about your program that you can transform with. We have the notational semantic, but again, where are you going to start to you know build your own FRP? Because I start my own implementation FRP with two main goals: one, to understand better the domain. Uh, um, this domain, right? But second, because there was nothing about uh, FRP in F-sharp, right? I had to build my own. So according with uh, uh, some paper and, and, uh, and uh, Connor Elliott, the, the, there are four main uh, points, really, that are summarize the sense of functionality programming. One is a temporal model, modeling, which covers the behavior, right? It's first class. And uh, Behavior can be composed and created from other behavior. Then there is the event modeling, which covers the discrete side of the event, right? And the event, you know, first class, it can create behavior or change behavior. Then we have the declarative the, the reactivity, which means that uh, behavior are expressed in a, in a of reaction to event, right? And the polymorphic may they just uh, describe the set to combination or combinator used to combine event and, and behavior together. All right, still confused. Until finally, I read this paper probably my fourth and fifth time. And this is where I finally have my Eureka time, right? This is probably one of the best paper and because really I associate my experience that I feel smart for once. So I was struggling and implementing the, 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 this library and I reread this paper, I don't know why, and finally, rereading re this paper, I found some part of the paper that actually was telling me exactly my problem and telling me the solution. So, this paper is, was a uh, um, push and pull FRP, was written from Connor Elliott in 2009, with a goal to um, remodernize the first implementation. Uh, Beside a better denotational semantic, but introduce, introduce also notion and concepts such as monads and applicative that didn't exist in the first implementation, right? But one of the things that really blew my mind is how I was able to invert the pooling model from pooling to pushing, right? Because in the first implementation, you have to sample the behavior each time to get the value, right? And the problem with that, well, there are three problems. Right? First, think about, is the behavior a constant? Why you have to keep asking for the same value? Never change. Or maybe a behavior that is created or depend upon an event, if the event never triggered, never changed the value, and again, why to sample it, right? So, so we're able to invert the, the, this process from pull it to push in, and it really change all the semantic and make uh, my life way easier. So. This is our look, that set implementation, right? And what he did in the paper really refer to reactivity. And uh, it decomposed the behavior in two components. The reactivity values, right? Which is uh, independent of time, and uh, the time function, which is dependent of time. And the idea really, uh, breaking apart the behavior uh, is a chain of phases where each phase is phase themselves, right? And um, so the behavior is really followed uh, by, by, by a new behavior, right, with the time when the, the, the change happened, right? So this is a, my, my F-sharp uh, interpretation implementation. And see how uh, this, is, this is probably more clear. The pure function, right, you just take a value and lift the value. But you see in, in, in F-sharp, we use the uh, rec keyword when you use a recursive function, right? So this function just recursively calling self and pretty much almost out of dating, right? Lazily out of dating. And uh, as well also the time function, or the identity function of the time, the return time, again, exactly the same, right? Event, I don't know if I'm really interpreted correctly, and maybe if anybody of you have a better approach, please tell me, but it works. So, 
for the event, I do exactly the same approach. The only difference that, you know, is a, um, maybe some is an option. And uh, what is interesting now is that, according with this paper, now the behavior uh, can be composed in a different way, right? Because behavior now are just applicative. And there are, you know, different uh, uh, benefit with that, right? So uh, we have the pure function, right? And uh, take a value and embed it in a behavior just, just as a constant function. But now uh, this is nice because we can leverage what we already know, right? And we have all the specification laws for free. So we don't go crazy and create, you know, a uh, um, thing we don't know actually if it works or no. It just works. And now we can rewrite uh, the in rectangle behavior in the previous example, right, using the, the, the apply uh, operator, right, which applies uh, time varying function or over to time varying value simply by applying the time for each time, right? You just do it by itself. I don't have to do anything, right? Any question? All right, so, and for the event, this is uh, also come from the API for the uh, modern approach of the event, right? So, it's a bit more complex of the, the behaviors, right? So, we have the never event, never happen. We have the merge event, use this in fixed operator. Take an event type A, take an event type A, return a new event type A. But what is interesting, the last one here, because if you swap the two arguments here, is a very strong you know, uh, similarity with the FMAP, right? So really, we could make an event in instance of the functor class, right? So briefly, uh, before going to some code sample, we have all these combinators, and actually, uh, well, I'm going to see this combinator in action in a code sample, so I'm not going to spend much time here. Probably it's better to jump in, in, in some code. Uh, so for the code, I actually have two code samples. One boring, so I'm going to spend probably a few minutes, like probably four minutes, but really you're going to go through the core of the first implementation, which is okay. And uh, um, then we're going to go something a bit better, right? Something more in line with FRP, with animation. We're going to use this fancy object here, and the, 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 the game actually is took as an uh, example from the Haskell school, school Expression book, which I really like this book. This is a chapter of, um, about uh, reactive animation, I think it's called, and um, it's a very pleasant uh, book, and this chapter actually, they blame that they wrote this game in 20 lines, right? So, I wrote in F-sharp. Anybody guess how many lines? 40. We'll say 40. 37. Wait, we don't have type classes in F-sharp, okay? <laughs> so. Yeah. All right, so last slide, that just to introduce, leap motion here is a 3D and a motion sensor, and uh, I use the presentation is like, uh, introduce also Kinect and uh, other games too, but um, uh, what it does is really use a Cartesian uh, coordinate system, X, Y, and Z, give you more or less 100 frames per second, and we use this to play the game. All right, so skip, skip, skip demo, okay? All right, so let's go to demo. Any questions so far? All right. I understand it's Friday, so probably, I would be around for beers, so probably with the beers, you know, we're gonna talk about it. So this is gonna use the first implementation. Oh, anybody can see the code? Probably bigger, bigger. Uh, let's do. Uh, uh. Bigger, 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 bigger is better. All right, that's good. Yeah. All right. So this is the first implementation of uh, um, FRP, the original one, right? without activity. So this is a board example, but really trust me, actually it's pretty cool, because really go down to the core and, and explain pretty well how this is work. So bank account, right? I have two action. I have the deposit action, the withdraw action, right? Get some, deposit some cash, get some cash, that's fine. Then I can merge these two events using the merge function, which as we 
Uh, so the signature, if you can see it, take two events at the same time and return another event of the same type. Then I can use the accumulator function, take an initial state. In this case, the initial state is passed from the constructor here, which will be the initial state of my, uh, my balance, right? And I pass a function here from A to B, return B. In this case, I, I pass the plus operator, right? Just, I'm gonna keep summing the, 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 the deposit or the withdrawals because then I, I'm gonna show you the trick. And the accumulator a return a behavior, right? Because now this behavior has a close relation with this event. Every time something happens to this event, the behavior value is recalculated under the scene, right? Oops, too much. Then I suppose, so I can, the behavior I can be sample, right? Because this is the first implementation. Sample any time that I want, I get the current value of the behavior. So at the two event here, I send the value so I can trigger. And the trick, because I use the, just the plus operator, is because I send the amount to the widget to get the cash just with the negative value, right? So the code run here, I just start with 10, get some deposit, some withdrawals, and, uh, and, uh, and, and print in a console the result. Pretty simple, but there are no observable, no callbacks, no mutation state, no triggers, no register event. This is just you know pure FRP, which I think is pretty cool. So let's run it then. Uh, I'm gonna show you the implementation of shame. That was the first implementation. All right, so pretty boring, but it works, right? Send them out, take some money out, right? I'm not that rich, but that's fine. All right, so how does this work? So the, this is the class that uh, is used, right? So let's close here. So this first implementation is being used where I, uh, I used to work. And unfortunately, I had to interrupt with an existing project that used uh, an imperative language. So I had to make a workaround, and the signature of the behavior in this implementation used um, a pretty um, ugly you know, type. So the signature anyways match behavior to time and so on, right? But they use a constructor, no a uh, discriminator union. And so, but in F sharp, what is nice is that when you create this, um, this type, you can create all your function in, it still follow the uh, functional programming paradigms, right? But unfortunately, the function belong to the instance and object. I know somebody of you already throw it in the mouth, but, uh, but, you know, we have this function, map, filter, lift zero. And uh, by the way, we're gonna see all my code sample. I put the notation F sharp, which is a very strong type in fairness, but I'm not expecting all F sharp programmers, so I just, you know, denoted it there. It could be very more succinct without uh, specifying the types. So the reality is that you can extract this function in a module and then extract the, fun the, 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 the function and just reference now. So that's the trick that I did. In fact, in the end, the, 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 the bank account implementation, for instance, if you jump from the merge here, 12, is going to this module helper, right? So this was the trick that I did. But anyway, so this is the first implementation. Now, let's go to something a bit more sexy, right? Let's go to the game. And I'm gonna run the game, and then we're gonna jump to the implementation. So I'm gonna use my hand, right? So, all right, so whoa. Anybody can see it? It's pretty cool, right? So, so the idea here is that the ball actually, uh, I create a bunch of uh, behavior we're gonna check later in event. The idea is that, uh, for instance, the ball right now is traveling with a behavior that um, like the speed never change over time until something happens, like the event that is a collision, right? If they collide to one of the wall in the top on the right or, or left, the event fire, it change the direction of the ball behavior. 
and then uh, there is the, the, the speed, but also the game behavior, if I don't hit the ball, well, the behavior, unfortunately, is game over, right? So that's pretty cool. I mean, I think it's cool. <laughs> so how this is implemented, right? Let's go to the code, and then we're going to jump in the implementation. This is use the uh, more modern approach, right? So this actually, it doesn't use the, the ugly uh, um, imperative interrupt. This is pure functional, right? So this is really the, the type of signature that I've been using, right? So we have behavior, which is use the reactive model here, the event, and then the, the duplicative here. So the function is the game engine, which is, you can imagine, is the core. First of all, I create, the daily, you create a bunch of behavior, and then you compose them using this combinator, right? And then you're done. Actually, when you, as you go, you create your combinator, and then, well, wait a minute, I need a when behavior, because when the behavior happens, I need to fire this event. You create your behavior. And when you're done, you're building up, and you're done. It's pretty cool. So the, con the condition exposition, it just takes a float and return a boolean, right? What it does here, you pass an x value, which is the coordinate of your x position or ball, and check if it's inside the game window, right, between the, the, the right side and left side of the wall. Pretty simple, which is from uh, positive one to negative one, including also the, the radius of the ball. I do the same thing for the y position, right? The top. In this case, it'll be more complex because there is a one gotcha here. The behavior actually had to include the position of the x of the pad of the paddle because there is this guy here which is the conditional game over, because if the uh, y coordinate of my ball is on the negative one, it's game over, right? All right, so the lead position here is uh, the function that keep track of the coordinate of my hand, right? So, so the lead motion is uh, this cool sensor, right? And there are two components here there are two components here to use to write. Uh, um, one is the controller that is, uh, you know, uh, push you out the frame. And then you build your listener that take care of your frame. And then you just attach the listener. So um, the trick here when you build your listener is that uh, the own frame is what you care. Per design, probably understand why, but I'm not sure. Um, is not trade safe, right? So it sends you out 100 you know, frames per second. So what I did, I used, uh, uh, let's see, a little bit smaller, let's see. That's okay overall, I think we're gonna understand what's going on. Uh, F-sharp mailbox processor agent. So what I do here is no blocking from out the world. I'm pushing agent, uh, pushing the messages which is on my frame in my agent, and here don't worry about what's going on, but what's happening is just, it received the message and it just reduced my X, Y, and Z and, uh, in X and Y, right? And I keep a state in uh, my recursive loop of the last uh, computation. And then I create the get position that my function call to get the last calculation done, right? So my function here is really catching always the last calculation done. All right, now let's remake a big. Now the problem with that is that, again, this is not really true FRP because they treat the event uh, or the, sorry, the position of my hand as discrete. Instead it would be like continuous over time. So what I did to overcome this limitation, sort of, Yes, okay, I, I create this as an event, but then I create this accumulator behavior where it just take an, an initial value, like, like the bank account, right? You take initial value, take an event, and create my behavior. So the initial value is zero, zero. That's why when you start the game, you see the puddle all completely the left, right? And the implementation, the accumulator use a switch behavior, which take a, a 
take a, uh, an, an event, no, take a behavior, sorry, and an event that contains a behavior. When something happens, it switches the behavior of the event with the current behavior. So then we have the lead position, which is my hand position behavior. Just keep track of my hand. And what I do here, um, that I could modify my agent, but I figured out probably uh, two days ago, two days I changed the code. I use the FST, which is the like uh, F-sharp function to take the first item in a tuple. So I just remove the Y, because overall I just need my X coordinated, right? And then I put all together in my game engine state function. This is actually when everything starts. I have my um, zero, zero coordinated on my ball when start, and zero, zero coordinated on my hand. So I create my uh, behavior on my uh, ball coordinated with my um, zero, zero. So here is I create an event that happened when, and I, this is the function behavior, uh, they take a behavior and return a function. So in this case, when the conditional exposition, which I defined initially, they hit one or two wall happen, this event fire, right? So this is just, you know, bounce one or two wall that I use to define my velocity ball uh, behavior, right? And I use my accumulator here. So the velocity change based upon when my ball hit one of the two wall. Okay, same thing for the Y, right? So not repeat here. And then I just put everything together, right? I have my velocity, I have my position of the ball, X and Y. Now I have uh, this function called integrate. And actually is a, um, is a conventional name that comes to come from the um, ASCOL you know, uh, um, school expression book, they call uh, integrate when you apply some extra western mathematical, you know, function to apply uh, and, and change the current value of behavior to a different one just because you want to. And uh, I'll apply some physical equation just to, to, to describe the motion of the ball, apply some, some gravity and so on. So, and that's it, right? Now, finally, I just to put together with the game info behavior, which is take care of my current position y and x with the position of my paddle, and the condition of my exit game, which is happened when the, the, the ball is negative one, right? That they find initially. And this is it, then, then I run it. And then, then until behavior is, is the core that play the game, right? The until behavior, take the initial behavior, an event with a behavior and a behavior. So the, the, what's happening here is start with the game info. So the game is, is, uh, is on until the event, which is the conditional X event, which is the ball is negative one, the Y is negative one. So when this event happens, the two behaviors switch and the game is over. That's it. And all the implementation of the library that I don't want to go in detail, right, but it's all on GitHub and you can download it to play with. They are all here, which... is like, I think like two, 280 lines of code, something like that. So it, it, it's not terrible, but there are a lot of functions that you can use or, no, or not even use that are not even needed. So that's pretty much using the, the, the second approach of the, the FRP from the push and pull paper. Any question about the second part? I didn't go in detail about implementation because I know that, um, there are no about you know about how it's implemented, but high level, how does it work? About just create your behavior and be able to depend by event and just combine them, and that's it, right? All right. Any question about? Okay. Oh. I'm sorry. Uh, did you implement the ambiguous choice part of uh, that second paper? No. No. Is, uh, uh, however, that's a good question. I didn't. I didn't because I really 
didn't need it. However, it's very interesting. Uh, uh, um, that this is interesting. I didn't. I haven't needed in my 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 needs, but uh, yeah, and uh, probably I should because overall it's not that complex actually. Um, it's not that complex actually. From the F sharp standard point, we have more tools to build the ambiguous point uh, choice. I did it, but yeah, yeah, good question actually. All right, one more question. Yeah. Um, I'm curious over here on your right. Um, in the, the uses that you have been making of this FRP system so far, have you ever encountered a situation where you had some kind of a side effecting function in, in a, like a, an FMAP on your behavior, and has that caused any problems for you? And maybe conversely, have you ever had a situation where you, you actually made, made productive use of something like that and it, it actually made things easier for you? Well, so, really, there is no um, side effect. It's all hide it underneath it. However, there are side effects. There are some IO operations that happen underneath it, right? And then, and then the, I've, in my implementation, I kind of isolated and I try to control explicitly, and I know where they are, so. But, uh, you know, when you are like in console I operation or graphing operation, you do some I operation, right? But I never really encounter in any kind of problem for what I did. Okay, I mean, the thing that made me think about this is years ago I was doing Java, and I had an inspect statement that had like I++. Right. And every time I was trying to debug, I was I was screwing up my program, right. and and then it was like a really dough moment when I finally discovered what I had been doing. And it seems like it's a very similar situation yeah. to what goes on in an FRP, like a behavior if you're accidentally incrementing yeah. something so, when you meant to add one. No, that's a good question actually. And um, if you have wait one second here, uh, in my implementation, actually one challenge that I had was implementing the trade saf safety, right? Because uh, one problem is that uh, different, you know, different trends can access the same event or the same uh, behavior. It can mutate. No, I don't want to say mutate. Can change, you know, the behavior. Different event can change, right? So I did implement in a trade safe manner. It was a challenge. However, I didn't implement it exactly as I wanted. So I'm not super happy. But there are some sort of atomically. Uh, I call it atomically. Yeah, transactional. Sorry, I use the locking, and I plan it to use more like a, 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 an agent slash actor kind of message passing approach for that. But that's like in a to-do list. But yeah, so this is taking care of it, but not in a fancy way right now. Okay, cool, this thank like, you. I have a very proof of concept working on it like in a free time, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure. All right, well, thank you, Ricky. All right.